Good morning, Christ Church. My name is Casey Gaylord, and I'm the youth director here. And we are so thankful that you're joining us as we continue in our series, Undeniable. Would you please worship with us? And all throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms be away for spring. In every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see the promises and fulfilled. Father, we just thank you for your goodness, God. We thank you, God, that it is evident, Lord, every day of our life, God. Help us to be able to look, Lord, and to find these, these ways, Lord, that you are good, the ways that you are faithful, Lord. We just celebrate your goodness today, God. We pray, Lord, that you would meet us where we are today, God. We pray that your Holy Spirit would move in our lives. It's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. The mission of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Here at Christ Church, we're a United Methodist community, and we accomplish that through a simple three-step process. Experience God's love, develop relationships, and revive the world through service. For experiencing God's love, in two weeks we will be starting our Advent series, and it is titled The Year That Stole Christmas. And I know that some it might feel like Christmas has been stolen this year, but I promise it's not, and we're going to talk through that. 
Along with our new series, uh, we will be adding an additional online service at 8.30 a.m. on all of our usual platforms, and their service will be more traditional in nature, featuring hymns uh, as the worship music. For Develop, we will be having cheer bags, and these bags will be going along with our Advent series that's starting in two weeks and there will be a bunch of fun things for you to do with your household in those. Uh, if you're in a small group, your small group leader will be delivering those to your home on the week of Thanksgiving. If you're not in a small group, we would love for you to get connected uh, through our website. There are connect cards on there that you can fill out, uh, and we would love to get a cheer bag to you. For Reviving the World, uh, we are adopting families from Buchanan Elementary and from Fairmount Pines this year for Christmas. Uh, there will be families from two members to six members, and we would love for you, if you feel called, uh, to be able to supply Christmas gifts for them. There's more information for that on our website. You can also come alongside us in our mission through your tithes and offerings. There should be information on the screen now uh, to do that. Now will you please continue in worship with us. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount upward, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Sin and despair like the sea waves cold threaten the soul with infinite loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. kind of person that always likes to look for the bright side in any situation. And this week, as I looked at the scripture, we're going to be looking in, peeking in at a house party that Jesus attends. And so I started thinking back about the last time that we had people to our house for a, a celebration for a gathering. And that was a little bit depressing, uh, given our current situation, that I had to keep thinking back further and further. And I think the last time that we had folks over just for a, a celebration was uh, in February, when our small group came over to watch the Super Bowl with us. And I remember that party as everyone was there and we were eating and, and enjoying that time. Uh, but everyone left after the third quarter and my chiefs were uh, losing at that time. So everyone gave their condolences as they left. Uh, but then before most of them got home, the chiefs were then ahead and they went on to win uh, the Super Bowl. So uh, I'm not sure what that says about how good of a host I am for parties. And again, that wasn't necessarily the bright side. The bright side that I thought about was I think it's been about eight months since the kids and I have had to do cleaning in the house in order to host people for just a few hours, you know? Uh, that's the bright side for me. I think it's been eight months since we had to do that, that cleaning for guests where you gotta scrub every inch of things and get into every corner just to host people for a couple of hours at the house. Um, now, of course, we've done our regular cleaning and those kind of things, but one bright side, we haven't had to do that party cleaning uh, for quite a long time. 
And, and as I mentioned, I was thinking about that uh, because we were going to look at Jesus going to uh, a dinner party uh, at, at someone's house uh, in the scriptures. We've been going through the gospel of Luke chapter 7 and just seeing what Jesus has been up to and how that then applies to our lives. And we're going to finish up chapter 7 today. I did skip a few verses uh, because there were some that focused on John the baptizer and weren't focusing on Jesus, so uh, we skipped those in this chapter. Uh, but we're going to finish up the chapter here today, and then next week we'll just get to the beginning of chapter 8 and just see what happens right after this chapter in Luke's gospel. So I'm going to read the passage for us. We're looking at Luke 7, verses 36 through 50. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is the word of God for us today. This is the, the longest and kind of most, most detailed um, passage in Luke's seventh chapter. And so there's a lot we could get into. I'm going to try and stay focused, though, and uh, just give us the big picture and see what God might speak to us today. Uh, but Jesus is invited to this dinner party at a Pharisee's house. A Pharisee, we, we learn, his name is Simon. And a Pharisee was a religious leader in Jesus' time, well-respected in the Jewish community, and someone that a lot of people would want to be around. And so he has invited Jesus to come and have dinner with him at his house. And a lot of Pharisees in Jesus' time had some conflict with Jesus. They believed Jesus saw things in their faith a little bit differently than he did. But this one was kind of open and, and willing to host Jesus in his house. And so he has Jesus come over. And it says as they're having that dinner party, then that there are uninvited guests that are around. And now that to us seems a little strange. That's not common in our day to have a dinner party and have uninvited guests come. I, I hope that people don't just show up often at your house, but maybe every once in a while you have an uninvited guest. But in Jesus' time, uninvited guests were all over parties like this. Uh, it would have been common for, uh, for uninvited guests to be around because they didn't have movie theaters or coffee shops for hanging out or entertainment, that when someone had a party, the, the guest would get there and the guest would have a place at the table. And then uninvited guests, everyone else in the village is welcome to come. And, and they could stand around. They tried to stay. They weren't going to the table, but they'd stay away and, and stand back in the room or in, in windows or doorways. And they would come because they would get to participate in the entertainment or the teaching that was going to take place. So this was kind of a common thing to have uh, these uninvited guests around them. And one of those uninvited guests was a, a woman. And it said that she came, and I, I assume she didn't just kind of stay back because she made her way to Jesus' feet. And as she stood over his feet, it said she began to weep. And, and her tears fell on Jesus' feet. And as she saw that his feet were getting wet, she bent down and, and with her hair began to dry his feet. And she kissed them and she poured perfume that she had brought uh, onto his feet. And as she was doing this, uh, which was kind of a common thing at, at, 
as people had their feet washed. You probably heard of foot washing uh, back in Jesus' time. And so it's a little different, again, than we would picture it. Uh, they didn't have a table like this where you'd sit on a chair and have your feet under the table. It was more of a, a table that was lowered to the ground, and the, the guests would sit at like a couch, and they'd have kind of a cushion where their left arm would, would lean, and then with their right hand they could grab their food, and they'd lay their feet out behind them. And just it says he was reclining at the table. And so that's kind of how Jesus was. And so she stood back by his feet. And then having his feet washed was, was common because back in those times, people would walk around either with no shoes or with sandals on those dirty, dusty roads. And so it would be often a thing that you would offer as hospitality, as someone would come into the home to wash their feet, uh, somewhat to keep some of the dirt and things out, but also just to refresh them uh, and just show them that hospitality. And so she begins to, to wash his feet and, and to care for his feet. And we learn that this woman that is doing this uh, has a reputation. She's well known uh, among the village and the area. And one translation that, that I read uh, called her a harlot. Uh, the NIV just says this was a woman who had lived a sinful life. Uh, but our assumption is that she does not have a husband, but she has been with many men. And so that reputation is known. And uh, Simon begins to wonder who Jesus is, that he can't be a very powerful prophet if he doesn't realize that it's a sinful woman washing his feet. And he just thinks that in the scripture, but yet Jesus uh, says answers him. And Jesus responds to those thoughts in his mind. And, it, and we might think, oh, he knows what's, what's going on in his head. He can read his mind or he can read his heart. Uh, my thought is I wonder if he can just read his face. If it's just the eyes and the facial expression of Simon as he glares at that woman that Jesus realized what's going on inside of him. And Jesus responds. He sees a, a teaching moment about to happen. And so he shares a parable, and a parable is a story with a point. He says there was two men that owed money to someone. One owed, I'll say, 500 bucks, and the other 50. And so they both needed forgiveness, and he forgives their debts. Which one would be more grateful? And Simon says, well, the, the one that had the larger debt forgiven. Jesus says, you are right, and, and this woman has been forgiven much. And so Jesus offers her forgiveness, and he sends her away uh, says, go in peace. And it's in the midst of that that the other guests at that party, most likely other Pharisees, begin to wonder, well, who is this Jesus? Who is this that can forgive sins? They don't believe that Jesus should be doing that. And yet he, he sends her away. And it's in the midst of that that as we look through this chapter, if you've been following along with us, uh, this is our fourth passage we're looking at. It's the, really the fourth time that people have been wondering, who is Jesus? Uh, and they're trying to kind of figure out who he was. In the first story, it was a centurion uh, who was Roman, who was a Gentile, not a Jewish person, not a person of faith uh, with the people of Israel, and yet he was the one who had the greatest faith in Jesus and his ability to heal. In the second passage that we looked at, it was Jesus raising a young man uh, back to life and giving him back to his mother, and it said the village began to think a great prophet has come and found his way to us. And then we have John the baptizer sending two of his disciples to Jesus saying, who are you? Are, are you the Messiah, the chosen one of God, the one we've been waiting for? And now we have Pharisees, religious leaders, wondering who exactly is this Jesus? Is he a prophet? Maybe not because he didn't recognize this sinful woman touching his feet, uh, but also he's offering forgiveness to people. And so this whole time they've been trying to figure out who Jesus is, and I think this passage does a great job of reminding us who Jesus is and what he's all about. The first thing that I noticed that I think Jesus is all about is that he's in community with Simon the Pharisee and with a harlot. He holds community with both of those people. He's, he's willing to be seen with them, to care for them, to speak with them. He's willing to be with, with both of those folks. And it just reminded me that, that Jesus lives in a community of contrast. Jesus lives in a community of contrast. He lives with the Pharisees, those that are religious and uh, think they are righteous, but he also lives with the harlot, with the woman who has lived a sinful life. Jesus is in community with both of them. And it's a reminder to me that, that here at Christ Church that we should have a community that also has contrast. We should be in community here where we also have Pharisees and we have people who have lived in sin. And we have all of us gathering together uh, forming our own community of contrast. If we all look the same and, and act the same, uh, then we're missing something from what Jesus wants for us. 
that we need to be a community that has that contrast, that, that diversity uh, in our lives. And, and there's more than just the one or the other uh, and so many people in between, but we, we are all gathered together then into Jesus's community. Uh, we have this community of contrast. And what this reminds me of um, as the leader and, and as a speaker here uh, at Christ Church is so often I try and keep in my mind that we have different people listening. And, and I want to speak to different people in different ways and, and try and get a message across to everybody at the same time, which is not an, an easy thing to do. It's a challenging thing to do. Uh, but I believe that's what God wants us to do, to speak to, to so many different people and try and connect with them. So I'm always trying to keep that in my mind. And, and that really is something that we value here at Christ Church. Uh, I've been talking the last couple of weeks about things that we value, what we think is important. And one of our values is relevant worship. We want to have relevant worship. We want to have worship services. We want to have messages that speak in, in relevant ways uh, to those who are listening, to those who are gathering in our community. That means we want it to meet people right where they are, whether they're a Pharisee or whether they are someone who's lived in sin, like that woman. Uh, we want it to meet them there and, and speak to what's going on in their life. And again, that's a challenge. It's something that's difficult, but I believe it's what God wants us to do, uh, to speak to a diverse and, and contrasting community uh, so that they might hear the message of God's love and God's grace. And so I see Jesus with this, this contrast, and, and really he gives kind of a message here trying to speak to everyone that's gathered there. Uh, it's a tough message. It's a challenging message because he shares that parable, and then he begins to contrast and compare uh, Simon the Pharisee with the woman, the harlot. And I don't think I could ever do anything like this. Um, but if you all would want me to do a message, maybe it's a new message series we do. If you want to volunteer, I can have one of you stand right over here and have somebody else over here, and then I can begin to tell all the bad things that you've done. I can tell, here's what you've done wrong. Uh, here's where you missed the mark. Here's uh, where you're just not doing it very well. And now let's look at this person and look at how great they are. They've done wonderful, and they're awesome. They're, they're really, what he's saying is, is, Simon, why can't you be more like her? right? Isn't that the message out there? Simon, can you not act like this woman? She's the one who acted uh, honoring and, and giving me hospitality as I gathered here at your house. And so he's contrasting their behaviors in, in order to try and teach them uh, a message and, and speak to where they are in their lives. And so that's, uh, uh, to me, a huge challenge. Again, I would never do that because even if, someone, if I saw that happening, I would kind of get all cringy and um, just kind of feel the pain of the person up there publicly being called out like that. I won't do things like that, but Jesus does it here. And I think, again, he's trying to, to reach them and speak this message to them, to show them that, that God has something more in store for them, uh, that God wants them to, to change their behavior. And, and honestly, I, I see the woman is the one that's changed here. As she goes away, she knows that she belongs to Jesus' community. She knows she belongs with him. And so he's speaking that to her, and I think he would tell that to Simon too. Simon, you can learn, you can grow, you, be, you can begin to act uh, the way that she did. And that can be a transforming thing in your life. And so he's speaking to two different people. And, and yet I think there's really just one message that he's trying to offer to them. They kind of have two different takeaways. Uh, he's saying, Simon, you need to, to see this woman a little more. I love that he, he asked her after that parable, do you even see her? Do you see this woman? Do you see who she is? Uh, the, the love that she has to give or do all you see is the past, the past sins that she has lived? You need to see who she really is. He wants him to open his eyes. And for the woman, he says, go in peace. He wants her to, to go knowing that she has been forgiven and that she is uh, someone who belongs in Jesus' community. And so they're both having something to take away from this situation. And, and in a sense, it looks different, but also I think it's really just about one thing. I think there's really just one message that Jesus is trying to share with both of them. And, and we see it in his parable. Did you notice in his parable, he has two people that owe money to a moneylender. And which one of them needs forgiveness? Which one needs forgiveness for their debt? It's both of them, right? Both of them, not just the one with the larger debt. Both are forgiven and set free. And I believe what Jesus is telling both of these people and telling all of us is that we all need forgiveness forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. Whether we're like the Pharisee and, and we're, we think religion is important and we focus on it and try and learn and grow in it and, and we can offer parties for Jesus to come at, or whether we're like the woman who has sin in her past, has lived that sinful life, 
Both of them need forgiveness, and, and we do too. Whether we have a lot to be forgiven for or whether we have a little to be forgiven for, we all need forgiveness and to turn to Jesus and, and ask for that forgiveness and receive it. I believe in this passage we kind of see the, the woman receives that forgiveness. We're, we're not told whether Simon does or not. We're not told if he turns to Jesus and asks for that forgiveness. We're not given that part of the story. But what I believe and what I know is that if he did turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me for the sin in my life, that Jesus would have done it in a heartbeat. He would have offered it right away. And so we need to remember that whether we have little sin or we have a lot of sin, that we are all in need of forgiveness. And so we can turn to Jesus and ask for that forgiveness, and, and he will forgive us and set us free. And so I have some application for all of us today that we need to take some time uh, to confess our sins to God and, and be forgiven. Whether we, our confessions are, are short or whether they're longer, it, it doesn't really matter. We all have sins that we can confess and we can offer them to Jesus. And, and one thing you might want to confess uh, from this passage, uh, I know it's one that I will need to confess, is that sometimes I judge other people. Sometimes I look at others and I'm, I'm really quick to find out, hey, they're not living the same way I'm living. They're, they're less than I am. Uh, they have more sin in their life, and so I try and focus on that opposed to focusing on the sins that I have in my own life. And so maybe I need to confess that and say, God, forgive me for that. Help me to have new eyes that, that aren't looking to judge other people, but looking to see how I might change, how I might grow in hospitality, and how I might grow in honoring you as I live my life. And so I encourage all of you to take time uh, this week to just think about the, the confessions you need to make, the sins that you have in your life. Again, whether it's little or whether it's much, all of it can be forgiven uh, because of the grace that Jesus gives. He offers undeniable forgiveness to all of us, to Pharisees, to harlots, to people like you and me. We all can receive that forgiveness. And so that's the first thing I want you to do is to confess to him and allow him to give you that forgiveness and He'll say, go now and live in peace. Live a different way. Uh, turn in a new direction and have the new life he offers for us. So that's the first thing to do. The second thing is tell the story. Tell the story of forgiveness in your life. And so find someone else that you can share with them uh, how forgiveness has changed you, how forgiveness has brought you peace and reminded you of God's grace. Uh, share with someone how, how God's forgiveness has really turned your life around, or you can share a story of how forgiveness has changed a relationship. Uh, maybe there's a relationship that was broken, and uh, whether you offered forgiveness or whether you received forgiveness from someone else, um, there's a story there and how God brought that relationship back together and brought healing. And so maybe that's a story that you want to share with others, uh, because forgiveness is such a powerful story. And, and so many of us miss the mark or we don't see uh, our need for forgiveness and we need to share that story that we all are in need and that Jesus offers it freely. And so share that story of forgiveness with other people. That's your, your story to tell for this week. Uh, through it all, we see that Jesus, in, in a community of contrast, lives out the fullness of love and grace uh, and he offers that forgiveness to each and every one of us. So I pray that we'll receive that this week uh, as we remember Jesus, the one that offers undeniable forgiveness. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the forgiveness that you give to us. Help us to, to keep in mind that our call is not to look uh, around and to judge others, uh, but our call is to turn to you and receive the forgiveness that you offer. Lord, we, we confess that we do miss the mark, that we don't always live the way that you want us to live. And it's through your spirit that we can be transformed and changed. So, Lord, help us to recognize uh, we live in a community of contrast with uh, so many different backgrounds and uh, so many different lives have been lived, and yet you gather us together uh, as a community of forgiven people, uh, living out your love and your grace. God, bless us in that as we tell your story of forgiveness this week. It's in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. And all throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. In every season, from away.
help me remember 